different setup today here. So let's hope that, that this works. Okay, people, uh, we are going to start our second lecture uh, on advanced electromagnetics. We, in the last lecture, first lecture, we ended um, after defining vectors, some elementary vector algebra, which spoke about coordinate systems and coordinate transformations. Um, now we are going to talk, talk about some, uh, you know, important concepts. We are going to talk about integration in 3D space, which includes line, surface, and volume integrals. Um, in fact, we use those uh, things, you know, integration in volumes and surfaces or over the paths uh, to define uh, some differential operations on vectors. Today, specifically, we're going to talk about one of those, which is the gradient. And we are going to uh, define the del or the nabla operator. Um, we have, a, uh, let's start with uh, the concepts of integration on a path, on a contour. Uh, or on a line, okay? In fact, uh, we have to consider that every time we have two surfaces in 3D space and they may intercept, you know, that surface has two in this case here, a segment of the surface, another surface here, right? Then those two surfaces, they intercept in a line, in a path, C. So a um, uh, segment, line segment, is always the intersection of two surfaces, okay? This is, we are talking about 3D space, but this concept can be generalized in, um, in uh, multidimensional spaces, okay? But let's talk about um, our traditional 3D space, where we are going to work. Um, for instance, this, the condition S equals zero is a set is a relationship between three, three coordinates. If we are working on the Cartesian uh, or the rectangular system, we have x, y, and z. So we have a relationship between those three, and that defines a surface, right? So if you have two surfaces, two conditions uh, represented by those uh, equations, S1 equals zero and S2 equals zero, the common solution of this, solution of this system yields a curve or line or a path, okay? So uh, this is a, a path in 3D space. Now let's see, let's suppose that we have a function of three variables for instance, f equals a function of uh, x, y, and z. That could be, for instance, a density function, mass density or charge density, which depends on the position on the body. This body might, might be a segment, a curve, a line, right? This function is a scalar function. We are going to start talking about uh, integration using scalar functions. Um, then we, um, let me just go back to my notes here, so I can follow there. We are going to make a first definition, and this is a very fundamental definition and a very important one. Uh, because every other type of integral, integration, line integration in fact, will uh, reduce to this type of integral, which is a line integral over C relative to a single variable, let's say U, okay? So we have a function F of U, V, and W, and we are going to define our first concept, a line integral over C, which is a known path, a non-line segment, 
relative to one of the variables. We are going to start the discussion in the rectangular system. Then we go to the other systems. For instance, uh, let's say that we are talking about uh, the u variable is sorry, u variable is the x parameter in the rectangular coordinate system. Okay, then I have two, two points, p1 and p2. Then it means that at p1 we have a set of coordinates x1, y1, and z1. And at p2 we have a set of coordinates x2, y2, and z2. We have the, the, the path C, which is a con which is defined by a common solution of these two surfaces, right? So we have C. When we do that, and if you want to make a line integral, let me. Um, I have to to do another notebook here. Where's my, my notebook? Uh, here, notes. That's the one. I need another one here. Okay. Um, if you want to calculate the line integral of a function, okay, um, between two points, I, I'm going to say uh, over, instead of calling over C, let's say over C1, 2, because this is just a line segment that starts at point 1, ends at point 2, of a function relative to one variable, okay, dx. So I'm making the integration over, over C1, 2 relative to one variable. I'm going to call this integral ix. I'm just saying that I'm doing the integral over C, but relative to one coordinate, okay? So what does it mean? It means that if I have the two conditions, uh, s1 equals 0, which gives c1, 2, right? c is given by, given by this. c might be a larger line segment, okay? Uh, and c1, 2 is just a small pa part of the segment. So it means that I have to transform this set of equations because uh, I want to make the integration relative to x as a variable. I have to transform these conditions to two conditions, which are I have to parameterize y totally as a function of x and z totally as a function of x. So I have to work out all these equations, these two equations, to reduce them to these two conditions, right? So uh, when we do that, we, we end, right? Uh, we have to put here y of x, and here we are going to put z of x, and as a result, this whole thing, f of, um, let's write like this, x, y of x, z of x, becomes single function of one variable x. So when you use a condition that defines the, the path, we reduce ix to a simple integral which we are used to do, which is a integral between two points. Initial point is the value of the x coordinate at point one. And the upper limit is the value of the x coordinate in point two. And we have a simple integral, fx dx. So that's how we do it in practice, okay? That's how we do the calculation in practice. So line integral over a path, over a line segment, relative to one variable, always reduced to a simple integral of one variable, okay? Let's make a simple example here. Um, That's the example that we have in the class note. Consider this uh, function, um, let's say f equals 2x plus y plus z squared. In the line segment, which is a, uh, 
a straight line segment, okay? Y equals X, Z equals X. The line segment is drawn right here. Uh, y equals X is a uh, plane, right? All the points in which Y and X are the same. So it's a plane that is, uh, you know, uh, sorry. It's a plane which is deviated from the x-axis uh, with an angle of pi over 4, right? That's the y equals x uh, surface. The other one is uh, z equals x, which is this one here, right? So it's all points in which we have a deviation um, uh, you know you have a deviation here. Oh, sorry about that. We have a deviation. the line deviates from x by pi over four, over four and also from z over pi over four. So the interception of those two things, I'm going to just erase those is simply the, the path C, which is the straight line that goes from the origin to the point, the final number point. So in this case, P1 is the origin, 0, 0, 0, and P2 is the point 1, 1, 1, right? So this, the, so this defines the path, the line segment, which is right here. This is the function I want to make the integral. These are the initial and final points. Okay, so let's calculate I Y of F over C. So you want to make a line integral of F over C relative to the Y variable. Okay. So what we have to do is to parameterize everything relative to y. So what we want to do is to calculate i y, which is integral. And the final part of it is going to be from the initial point y1 to y2, f of x of y, y, z of y, dy, right? Uh, so, I'm going <laughs> to be holding this this little wire here all the time, and maybe I can ha have a way of not doing it. Perhaps I can do that. Okay, I don't have to do it anymore. <coughs> so, where do we get those uh, functions? Well, uh, we just look at the surfaces. Uh, one condition is x equals to y, x equals to y. The other is x equals to z, or z equals to x, but x equals to y, so z equals to y. So we have x equals to y and z equals to y. So we are already parametrizing the function relative to one variable. So here's the function f of y, which is going to be 2 times x, which is equals to y, plus y, plus z equals to y, y square, so it's 3y plus y square. So that's the integral we have to do, i y equals to integral from initial point y is 0, second coordinate, to 1. So we have... Uh, 3y plus y squared dy. And this one is very easy, right? So it's going to be 3y dy is y squared over 2 plus y squared is y cubed over 3. Everything from 0 to 1. This is going to be 3 halves plus 1 third, which is 9 plus 2, 11 6 sixes, right? 11 over 6. That's the result, the number. Right? Just making a practical example. 
of uh, how to do an online integral of a function over over a, a, a path relative to one variable. Okay. Um, well, the next concept we're going to talk about. Well, that's understood. We go now to move on to make a line integral over C relative to the displacement along the path, right? Uh, now it's a little different. We want to make the integration and the, the differential element is the small uh, differential length along the path, like this one. We have uh, initial point, final point, that's the element. So that's the line integral over C relative to the differential length along the path, to the displacement along the path. So that we are going to denote IL, right? Just to mention that the integral, the integration variable is DL. So now we have the function, we're talking about rectangular coordinate system, we're going to change that. Uh, but now we have a function of um, x, y, z, and we have to find a way to parameterize everything in terms of one variable, including the L itself, itself right? L has to be parameterized relative to one of the coordinates. Or I can parameterize everything in terms of L, but L might be a complicated variable, so we might want to parameterize everything that is, is inside the integral um, in terms of one of the, those X, Y, and Z, or Z variables. Okay, that's what we want to do. Okay, so we have to understand, um, in order to do that, what is the L? What is this small length? Now we're going to turn to our vector algebra to do this, right? Well, what is the L, huh? The L is the length of a vector. In fact, that's what the L is. The L is just the length of a vector. So it's the magnitude of a vector we are going to call the displacement or differential displacement vector, right? That's what the L scala is, is the magnitude of a vector, which is a differential displacement vector, right? So, how can we express the L in the coordinate system? Well, uh, it's very easy, you know. Uh, you just take a look at how we would draw the L in, a, for instance, in the rectangular coordinate system. Well, it would have three components, right? One along the X direction, which is the X one along the y direction, which is the y, and one along the z direction, which is the z. So that's what the L is. The L is the vector sum of those two, those, sorry, those three differential variations on x, y, and z, right? So um, that's how we express the L, for instance, in the uh, rectangular coordinate system has uh, the x component along x, a the y component along y, and a the z component along z. And for instance, if it's easier for us to do the whole parametrization in terms of the x variable, we are going to parameterize the L in terms of the x variable as well. Let's say that that be the case, right? So what do we do? Remember, one important thing 
in integration and when you're doing calculation of integrals. Variables, I mean, differential elements in integrals, let's say the x, the y, the z, and etc., they are always, they don't have sign. They are uh, always something like this. Positive, right? Uh, the outcome of the integral, if there's some sign, if x is increasing or decreasing, uh, the elements that take care of this increase or decrease of the variables is not the differential elements, but the, the range of integral. For instance, if I go from x1 to x2, okay, I'm going to use my dx without a sign. If x2 is larger than x1, okay, if I change the, if I reverse the integral here, so this will be x2 minus x1. If I make it made a simple simple integral, right? If I revert the revert the, the upper and lower limits, the x is still the same sign, right? So the final result is x1 minus x2. So these are uh, have different signs. One is minus the other, but the the elements in the integration that take care of the sign are not those that have the dx or the y or the z, but the upper and lower limits. So always the x, the y, and z disease are always positive elements. Okay, it's very important not to forget. Sometimes we might get confused, but we have always to keep that in mind so your sign at the end of your calculation is correct. So, <coughs> so remember that the x is always a positive element. So what happened here? So I can, if I want to parameter in terms of x, so I will put uh, the x as a factor, and then I'll have one ax plus ay, the ratio between variations that y and x, differential, the ratio between, the dif uh, you know, the differential values, which is a derivative, in fact, and the z over the x. So magnitude is calculated using that uh, recipe, you know. Magnitude is dot product between the vectors, the same vector with himself, with itself, root square of that. Then by doing that, you have a way to express the L in terms of one of the variables, I'm choosing x because, uh, for instance, in, in a given situation, it's easier to integrate in the x uh, variable. So that's how we do it. So, so we have to calculate those derivatives here, dy dx, dz dx. And that's what would become the line integral of f relative to, I mean, uh, relative to the DL, but now I parameterize it in terms of one of the variables in this example, in terms of X. So th that's what the integration becomes, right? Uh, you're going to have uh, F, I, I parameterize everything in terms of X. So again, this becomes a function of X. I know the function uh, Y of X and Z of X, so therefore I can calculate the derivatives dy dx, dz dx, everything is expression expressed as a function of x. Then I have a single integral, I forgot here to put the dx outside, right? I have to put the dx here. Uh, I forgot that, so my integral has a dx element there. So that's how we calculated the line integral relative to the displacement along the path. And that integral reduces to uh, integral relative to one variable. The var which variable? The one that is easier to, to do the calculation, right? Um, 
So I can also do other types of, uh, you, know, you know, if it's easier to parameterize in terms of Y or Z, then I would, I would parameterize my DL, for instance, Y. Uh, to calculate IY, I would uh, do something like this. Uh, I would pick DL. I would put, uh, I would factor out DY, and then I would make DX DY square plus one, right? Which is dy dy plus dz dy square. So I would express everything in terms of y. That's how we would do the integral. Um, question, why is, is this is not a partial derivative? Well, because when I do the set of two equations that define the path, each of those functions let's say x of y is a function of a single variable. So that's why these are total derivatives. x of y, total derivative of x relative to y, and so forth. Okay? Uh, okay. Um, let's continue. Well, the question re now comes, what about other coordinate systems. How would I do calculations of uh, line integral relative to the displacement along the path in other coordinate systems? How would I do that? Okay. Um, well, so what would be DL for a general UVW system? So, same principle, right? I mean, the L is going to be along the first direction, AU, we're going to have a small differential length, the LU. Along the second direction, AV is the versor, we would have the second length, the LV, and along the third direction, the LW. In general, we have those H parameters, which are specific for the coordinate system, in which, I mean, you have a relationship in general, right? A small variation of coordinate has to be multiplied by a parameter, a scale factor, to produce a length. Recall, for instance, in the cylindrical coordinates, one of the coordinates is angle, which is a dimensional, right? Is the azimuth. Um, phi. So d phi is a dimensional. So along a phi, what would be the length? Well, I have to multiply it to a scale factor to make to become that so that product becomes a length. So I always have to use a scale factor along the three direction h1, h2, h3, okay, to produce the lengths that I need. DLU, DLV, DLW. For instance, in the XYZ system, the H parameters are all equals to 1, right? Because DLX equals to 1 DX. DLY equals 1 DY. And DLZ equals 1 DZ, right? So. But the other system, that doesn't happen. So let's see in the other systems that we are... Um, working here. We have in the cylindrical system, for instance, right? Uh, along the R radial direction, if I make a small displacement R, uh, dr, sorry, the length that I produce is dlr equals to dr, right? So, H parameter in the along the, the radial direction is H1 equals to 1. On the other hand, along the azimuth, azimuthal versus A phi, right? To produce a, a small variation d phi for a given distance um, R, 
will give me this small segment which is R defined. So you notice that the coordinate changes by a differential amount, defy, and I have to multiply that by a small scale factor, r. So h2 equals to r, right? And finally, along the z direction, is the same thing as along the x or y direction, uh, dlz, equals to 1 dz, so h3 equals to 1, okay? So in the um, cylindrical coordinate system, you have the h parameters, right, Let me put it down, separate me here. I'm going to do it like this. Let's make a u let, let's make a table, UVW system and the H values. So in the core, uh, Cartesian rectangular system, we have X, Y, Z. H1 equals 1, H2 equals 1, H3 equals 1. Cylindrical system, R, phi, Z are the UVW coordinates h1 equals 1, h2 equals r, h3 equals 2, 1. And finally, in the spherical coordinates, r, theta, and phi, let's take a look at the picture here. We have to, to know what are the lengths produced in the three mutually orthogonal directions for a small increment in the variables. Along the radial direction, of course, the length produced is dr, right? So we have h1 equals to 1. The second direction, which is the theta versus, you know, a theta. Let's put it right there, like this. In this direction here, a, the direction of versor a theta, a small increment d theta will produce for a given radius r, right? We're going to produce r d theta as a length, a small variation. So second parameter is r. Finally, when I go from this value of phi which is right here to the new value here right so I have a variation here of d phi so I'm running on a circumference which has a radius which is this radio here R, this is theta, R sine theta. So that's the, the radius of the circumference here, R sine theta. For a small increment of d phi, right? So the length is R sine theta, which is the radius of that planar circumference times d phi. So the, th the, f the last h parameter is r sine theta. So those parameters might be linear or non-linear functions of the coordinates themselves, right? So here h2 in this case is a function for one of the coordinates is a linear function, but the other h is a function of two coordinates and is non-linearly related to sine to theta. Okay. So that's what we get. So if we uh, if, if we wanted to write in cylindrical coordinates, the general expression for the L would be along the first direction, the R, second direction, R phi third direction, the z, a z. That's in cylindrical, that's in spherical now. The R, capital R, 
AI plus um, R D theta, the second element in the in the system is R D theta, A theta, which is the second vector in the system, in the sequence, in the cyclic sequence, and finally R sine theta d phi, which is the third component in spherical coordinates. So uh, let's just complement with the the L in rectangular coordinates. Right? Now we have, so you see that um, any line integral relative to the length or to the differential length along the path, they reduce to the line integral of functions, scalar functions, that that's, that's what we are talking about right now. We are making integration of scalar functions. So it's a line integral of scalar functions uh, relative to one variable. So every time you can reduce those integrals to integration relative to one variable, okay? Uh, I, I, I will make an example. Uh, which is not in the notes, just to, to illustrate how to calculate things using line integrals, right? So let me see my pen, I think it's back. Let's do it. Let's calculate the simple example here. Um, let's say that we have a half circumference, right, of radius equals 1. make a planar uh, calculation. So we have a um, circumference. Let's see if I, this works. No, it doesn't. I have to make it a whole circumference. I'm going to make it like this. Okay. Now, uh, I'm going to erase this part here. I just want a part of the uh, just a half circumference. Uh, something like that. Uh, this has a radius, radius equals to 1. So this uh, this path here can be written in Cartesian coordinates. I can can make it in coordinates, but let's make it in Cartesian. It's more difficult, but uh, we can just practice a little bit, right? X squared plus Y square equals to one, and I want you to, to know the length of this path that goes from here. Let's let's make it like this. So X increases, right? from uh, x equals to minus 1, that's this coordinate, to x equals to 1, sorry, uh, 1, 0. I want to know the length of this, of this path here, right? So uh, I want to make integration. The length, let's call it, um, let's, call it uh, let's call it L equals to the integral from uh, P1 to P2, right, of this, length, this small length here, the L, right? So in this case, my function is equals to 1. So I can calculate the length by doing this. So now we know that in this case the vector the L equals to uh, AX dx plus AY dy, right? And I can parameterize relative to X if I want. So uh, let's put the X as a factor here. So here in 3D space, just to remind you, okay, one surface is the, let's say, plane Z equals 0. The other surface is the plane, is the cylindrical surface, x2 plus y, y squared equals to 1. So the intercept 
of those two gives this line segment. So that's why z doesn't appear in the equations, because z is zero. We are in the xy plane. So that's the L. So the L here is going to be dx uh, 1 plus dy dx squared, as we did before, right? Let's do like this. 1 half. So what we have to do is to use the equation of the circumference. Let's calculate derivatives here. I can de make the derivative is going to be 2x dx plus 2y dy equals to 0 or y dy equals to minus x dx. That's what we have. Let's move on to the next page. So uh, x dx, let me repeat here, uh, plus y dy equals 0. So expressing y relative to x, I, I, I make uh, dy times y equals minus x dx or dy dx, which is what we have there, right, equals to minus x over y. So in the root square, we have 1 plus dy dx, 1 plus x square over y square, which is equals to y square plus x square over y square, but y square plus x square equals to 1, and y square, uh, the root square is magnitude of y. Have to be careful, sometimes you have to do the correct way to do the root, right? But y in this, this example is always positive, right? So you don't have to worry about the sign. So this is going to be 1 over y. Okay? Looks complicated, right? So the length is equal to integral from x equals to minus 1 to 1 dx 1 over y. This is all complicated because we are doing the integration in Cartesian coordinates. So it's going to be dx over y. Again, using the equation x squared plus y squared equals to 1, we have y squared equals 1 minus x squared, and y, which is positive, is plus root of 1 minus x squared. Right? So we're going to have One minus x square. So uh, we can do in different ways this integral, but uh, you can do just x equals to let's say sine theta, sine of uh, let's let's not use theta to so we don't mix up with our spherical system. Let's make a different angle, sine alpha. Okay. So the x equals to cosine alpha, the alpha. So this is 1 minus sine square is cosine square. The root is cosine. So we have then cosine divided by cosine. Uh, for x equals to minus 1, alpha equals to minus pi over 2. So this length is going to be integration from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2 of the alpha, which is pi, which is half the perimeter of the circumference, right? This will illustrate a quick example here, calculation. That's how we do it. So, um, let's put this here so it doesn't fall. Um, well, these are all integral, line integrals, uh, relative to uh, the displacement or relative to one variable, right? But they always involve one scalar function. But we have more uh, in electromagnetics and the other field theories. We have vector fields, and sometimes we need to integrate those vector fields along paths. And then we have to consider then other types of integrals involving vectors, right? So we can build different types of 
integrals. We might, you know, um, face those integrals in our, our course or in more advanced courses. For instance, I might have a scalar function and a vector uh, differential element. So the result of this integration is going to be a vector, right? That's one type of integral. Another type of integral might involve the differential element is a scalar, right? And uh, you have a ve vector field times a scalar element, differential element. And again, you have a vector. We might have the cross product between the differential element and the vector field, right? So all of these are, line, are different types of line integrals that yield vectors. There's one special type which has a very interesting physical meaning, which is the integral that involves the dot product of the vector field, might be a physical field, right? And the differential element, FDL. And this is going to be a scalar result, right? And traditionally, uh, even though all those things are line integrals of vectors, for instance, right? This one, this is a line integral, this is a line integral, but traditionally we call this one here, the one that involves the dot product between F and L, as the uh, line the line integral of f. There's a tradition, right? That's the one we call line integral of f. I mean, not this one. This is not line integral of f. This is just an integral of f. Not that one, which is also line integral of f. But the one that we call line integral of f is this one here specifically, right? It involves the dot product between l and f. What exactly is this type of integral? In fact, this, I mean, it, it yields, it yields a scalar function, right? Um, but if you look, I mean, this is the vector field. Let's say that uh, this is the path, goes from one point to another one. Along the path, this is the differential vector, differ differential displacement vector. And the t is the tangent versor. Okay, so we can also write the displacement vector, differential displacement, is simply the magnitude times t, right? That's how we can do it. So doing the dot product between dl and f produces the projection of f along the tangent direction to the path. In fact, this is what? What is this in here? Scalar function, right? So we reduce the line integral of a vector to a line integral of a function relative to the length along the path. Right? So essentially, the line integral of a vector is the integral of the projection of that vector along the path. And the differential element is the differential length. So that's what we obtain. Obtain things that we did, we know how to calculate already, right? Line integral of a scalar function. As traditionally, we did that before, right? Uh, it's important to consider some situations in which we are going to, um, we are going to see uh, for instance, if they have a closed path like this, we are going to denote the line integral of f, the integral symbol. We're going to make a circle like this, just to make that is a closed path integral. And we call this sometimes, depending on the vector field, this has a meaning. Right? 
uh, for instance, might be the work of uh, an external agent to move an object over a gravitational field, for instance. Uh, we well know, it's well known, as, as well as in the electrostatic case, if you have an external agent moving a charge on an electric field, and going back to the same point, the, the network that uh, is done by the external agent is going to be zero. Same in the gravitational, gravitational field. So we're going to have a zero work. So if you look at F as a force, and we are doing the, you know, the network, network to go from point, initial point, and coming back to any, to any, you know, any, any, any path you choose is going to be the same result. It's going to be zero, in fact. But I mean, independently, if the field is what we call conservative or not, uh, when you do a line integral on a closed path, we call it a circulation of F. And this has a physical meaning. S some fields, like the gravitational, gravitational field and the electrostatic field, they have a closed integral a circulation of the E field is zero or the gravitational field the circulation is zero. So that's the same thing. In a generic UVW system, uh, you can calculate this line integral and reduce the line integral to a line integral of scalar functions, right? These are the dot products, the components of the dot products. ZLU DLV times FV and DLW. So in each one of these, U is the variable of uh, integration, V is the integration variable, and W too. So all the integrals are integrals relative to one variable. Okay. So that's what we ha we we have. Let's make an example. Following the class notes. Let's say that we have a vector field like this. Uh, F has two components. Well, again, you know, at z equals z, z equals zero. So one of the surfaces that appear in the intersection of surfaces to define the, the path is z equals zero. So, so F is given by this condition here. So we have a closed path here, like this, right? Um, you see that C1, uh, so all the lines are in the surface, uh, lie on the surface Z equals zero, right? So the first line segment is Z equals zero, and the other condition is, I'm going to show you here, Z equals zero, right, C1, and Y equals to X because this is uh, a pi over 4 deviation of the line relative to the x-axis. The second segment, y is consta constant, it, its value is equals to 2. The other, that's one surface, the other is equal to 0. The third segment, which is this one, x now is 0, right? and z equals zero. So th these are the conditions. So in each of those, we calculate f and the l, in fact, right? Um, this is very simple. Uh, f equals to x equals to y. So this is x squared here. x times y, which is x squared. y squared equals to x squared is right there. dl equals to dx plus dy plus dy equals to dx. So that's why, what dl is. Second segment, uh, y is constant equals to 2, so y squared equals to 4. x, y equals to x times 2, so we have that, right? 
And the L, well, y is constant, the y equals 0, so the L equals to the x, ax. Re notice that I don't put sign, I don't worry about the direction of the, of the paths. If x or y increase, I don't worry about that. I just use the differential elements with no sign. At the end at the, of the integration, I will choose you know, uh, if the x is increasing or decreasing, that will be reflected on the upper and lower limits of the integrals, okay? Um, finally, in the last surface, x is zero, right? So this term here goes out, and y is y. Y is variable, so it's going to be y squared. There's a vector field. On the L, again, the x equals 0, the y is the y. No sign. Okay, so everything is calculated. So F del here is going to be x2 right? Dot product ax with ax equals 1, ay with ay equals 1, so this is going to be 2x2 gives this one. Second, I mean, the, what about the limit? Well, x goes from 0 to 2. So that's limits. Second integral along C2, x, uh, we are parameterizing relative to x, right? So x goes from 2 until 0. Dot product here, let me erase everything here so you can see it. Dot product is going to be 2x dx, right there. Uh, is this right? Or is this? Oh, that's the one here, right there. 2x dx. And in the last one, uh, dot product is y square dy. I'm using y as a variable, uh, so in this case, I'm making an integration in y. So y changes from 2 to 0. So these integrals are easy to calculate. So this is 2x3 over 3. This is 2x squared over 2. This is y3 over 3. So this is going to be a number. You can do the calculation. We're going to have that minus four thirds. So that's how we, we calculate that, okay? Um, it's important to, to, I'm just going to talk about that right now. We are going to remind you guys on this concept again, but every time we do a line integral on a closed path, we are always going to do as this, if the path, um, or in the direction in which the area is on the left, okay? So it's like uh, doing the roll of the high, right hand, you know, in which you pick the path with your hand and imagine that the, you know, uh, the area, we didn't talk about that yet, but uh, I mean, the area is always on the left of this imaginary uh, traveler on the path, okay? So, every time we do that, we're going to use that convention. We could go the other, go the other way around, but I mean, to be consistent with uh, equations that we're going to settle, uh, Maxwell's equations, um, involving integrals, for instance, in closed paths, always we're going to use the area on the left. <coughs> well, this is all we have about line integrals, okay? Well, the only thing, the difficulty that we would have would be to define the differential displacement, and we did that in different coordinate systems. In fact, we did that in a generic UVW system, right? So let's go uh, over now to other type of important integral, which is the surface integral, which is a double integral, in fact. Um, in the course, um, 
we could do something like this. I, I mean, many people denote double integral like this. We are going to do that only at the end of the calculation. Until we get to the end of the calculation, we are going to make symbolic representation of the double integral with a simple, you know, uh, single integration symbol. At the end, when we have to split, we have to make the real calculation, then we split the integral in more than one, okay? But, I mean, surface integrals, they are double integrals. Um, and for instance, I can calculate, I can define one type of integral, which is a function calculate on over the coordinates of the surface. Let's call the surface capital sigma. And the sigma is a surface differential element on the surface. Um, so that's what we would have. We have a, sometimes we have a scalar field, right? For instance, we could have F as a surface charge density. And I want to calculate on this, on this surface, how much charge is in it. So I would integrate this surface charge density over the area. And the, uh, I mean, this is a curved surface, right? It's not simple. But somehow I have to transform it to uh, products of the coordinates that I'm working uh, to make the integral, I mean, to, to be able to calculate the integral, okay? Uh, one important special case of a surface integral is when you have um, a vector field projected along the normal direction to the surface. So we have a f dot n with n representing a normal direction to the surface. So we have a vector field. So you project that vector field along the normal direction, calculate the projection, and multiply by the, the sigma. Then you calculate that integral. This has a meaning which is called the flux of f true sigma. So calculation of um, surface integral of a projection of a field projected along the normal direction gives an important uh, quantity which is called the flux of f true sigma. For instance, f may be a, vec a velocity field and calculating the flux of velocity across the surface, you might be able to get the amount of matter that crossed the surface. Just to give an idea, right? So that's what could be. We, we are going to do example, practical examples of that. On a, on one example is going to be Gauss law, in which we have a flux density, and we integrate over a closed surface, you have a charge that is enclosed by that surface. But you can have vector fields, you know, uh, calculating flux of vector fields, which give you mass that are transported through surfaces. Okay? Um, so we define here this product here, uh, the sigma, which is a, a dimension of a square meter in the international unit system, right? Times the end, we call this the differential surface element, uh, the differential um, surface vector, right? The sigma. So we're going to have this vector, special vector, which is defined as having a magnitude equals to the differential area and direction along n. n is a normal direction to the surface. Well, it might be that direction, might be this one too. Depends on how you want to define. You want to define the flux, you know, um, to the upper part, you put your n to the top. I mean, you're pointing to the, to the upper part, right? So, um, so again, we have to deal with expressing the differential surface element in terms of the coordinates. Once again, if you look at this picture here, in a generic um, 
UVW coordinate system, the vectors, the versors, are orthogonal to the coordinate surfaces. For instance, uh, AU is orthogonal to SU, right? Well, SU is going to have two lengths. For small changes of the coordinates, we're going to have two lengths, which will give approximately the area, this differential area orthogonal to U, which is H3 dW, which is the length along the third direction, H2 dV. So uh, the U component uh, so if you want to know well the sigma will have three components, right? Along the U direction the sigma U plus along the V direction the sigma W and along the W direction the, sig the sigma V in fact the sigma W so this is the product of two lengths orthogonal to u, which is h2 dv times h3 dw. The same thing for the other ones, right? So just make a cyclic permutation, or cyclic if you want. Um, so this is going to be h3 dw times h1 du. One more permutation, H1 du times H2 dv. So that's what you have, right? So that's your general expression for the sigma in any system right here. You just look at one of those, you know, the other ones, by doing the cyclic or cyclic. Depends on where you are from. You may say cyclic or cyclic. Um, but you can have those three, those products, AU, AV, and AW, okay, like this. So it's easy to calculate in the different systems because we know the H parameters, right? The rectangular coordinates, H1, H3 equals 1, and so on. So it's the product of the differential lengths orthogonal to the direction that we are considering. Okay? So we have this one, along R, the R, the Z, along Phi, R, the R, the Phi, along Z, and uh, we have, uh, you know, more complex expressions here. Specifically, I like to use this opportunity um, to define uh, mostly. I mean, I, ca I can do I could do that also for cylindrical surface, but let's talk about spherical coordinates. Uh, the radial components right here, right? The radial components in spherical coordinates. is r square sine theta d theta d phi. So it's a product of a radial function and an angular function, differential differential function, right? Uh, and that enables us to define the concept of solid angle, very useful in many different instances. Uh, when we deal with Gauche law, or when we deal with the radiation fields, um, understanding the concept of solid angle facilitates our understanding of the phenomena involved. For instance, let me just point to you. Uh, I mean, angles are very interesting elements because they, in fact, define infinite regions using finite parameters. For instance, the region that is enclosed by those two arrows, those two, two lines, which is this infinite here region here, on this, you know, between two, two straight lines, 
But I use a planar uh, element, a planar angle, the alpha, to represent this region, right? How do I do that? I mean, the, the, the region increases indefinitely, uh, the radius increases indefinitely. And uh, how do I make a definition so that we have a finite parameter? Independently on, on where the thing is. I mean, I, I increase R indefinitely, and I always have the same angle, the alpha. Let's say a differential change in length, uh, you know, for a constant R. So I know that ds is proportional to R, right? Uh, so if I define the ratio ds over R, I'm going to have some finite element definition. This is a differential angle alpha. That's the definition of a planar angle, right? If you have a closed path on a plane, you have a total variation, of total angular variation of 2 pi. So the planar angle is something useful to define infinite regions using a finite parameter. So I just have a ratio between two things that increase indefinitely, but the ratio between those is always a constant value, the alpha. When I integrate on a closed path, I have a 2 pi. So a closed path gives me 2 pi radian, right? The same concept can be used in 3D space. Uh, this cone here, for instance, right? I mean, all this cone, if I go to infinity here, I have an infinite volume. What type of parameter, what type, what type of parameter can I define that represents this infinite cone, this infinite volume, right? So I have to define a ratio between an area that increases the square of the radius and the radius itself. So if I make the ratio, the ratio between uh, the area over the sphere spherical surface divided by the square of R, I will have what is called a differential of solid angle. Right? And if we look at the components, radio component of the sigma, that would give me this differential solid angle, the omega. So the omega is exactly, is exactly this part here. Right? So that's the, I mean, that's how we express the solid angle, the differential solid angle in spherical coordinates. So we would have a simple expression like sine theta d theta d phi. Observe that uh, I can make a cone that has any shape here, but I mean the solid angle is going to be the same. I mean I can just pick a, a, you know, a spherical cap, calculate the area, divide by square of the radius, I have the solid angle, differential solid angle. So what's the solid angle subtended? by a closed surface, right? So I just calculate, I mean, if I want to close the surface, what's the total solid angle that I get? Well, in this case, I make a simple integration. So the solid angle of the 3D space equals to integral of sine theta the theta, the phi. Theta is the polar angle, phi is the azimuthal angle. Azimuthal angle goes from 0 to 2 pi, which is this one here, and the polar angle goes from 0 to pi. So, this will give how much? Uh, well, uh, integral from 0 to 2 pi of the phi integral from 0 to pi of sine theta d theta. This is 2 pi, right? 
this is minus cosine theta from 0 to pi, or if we want, plus cosine theta from pi to 0. So it's 1 minus minus 1, which is equal to 2 times 2 pi, gives the solid angle of 3D space, which is 4 pi, which is a a dimensional number, but just to remember, I mean, the planar angle is in radians, which is a dimensional. The solid angle is gonna is a dimension, but we call it uh, stir radians. So that's what the three D space yields. Uh, for a closed path, okay? Uh, just to give you an idea how to use this concept of, of solid angle, sometimes we don't have to integrate in the angular variables in two integrals. Just integrate over the solid angle and the calculation becomes much simpler, okay? So this is the, the I mean, this is the concept. Planar angle used to define a planar region which is infinite in size, but we use a finite parameter to define it, which is the planar angle, right? The ratio must be a linear because length increases linearly with the radius. So that's why we have to make the ratio between two, two thing, those two things. In the case of 3D surfaces, an infinite volume can be defined by a solid angle by making a ratio between two things that increase in proportion. The area increase, increases with the square of the radius, so we make we divide that area by the square of the radius, then we have a finite parameter, which is the solid angle, right? Uh, let's make an example. Let's assume that we have a vector field, like so, which is a field which, which obeys the inverse square law, which are the gravitational fields, uh, gravitational acceleration, uh, electric field of a point charge. I mean, all of those have this behavior. Let's calculate the flux of this vector across the first octant. Okay, so that's what we want to do. On a spherical surface, across the first octant. In fact, the, the shape of the surface is not relevant, but let's say that it's spherical. Let's say that's a sphere of radius A. So uh, we know that the, the sigma in this case for a surface of radius A equals to A squared differential of solid angle AR, right? That's the surface differential surface on a sphere. And the field uh, over R equals to A is going to be AR divided by A squared. The dot product between those two, uh, I just missed my pen here, just a second. Just hold on a little bit. So uh, the dot product becomes, um, you see that uh, when I make um, the pro dot product between this vector and that one, the a square cancels out, right? AR dot AR equals 1, so we have only a differential of a solid angle. I don't have to do much, right? It's first octant. Uh, if one octant has uh, one eighth of, so, sorry, of four, 4 pi stair radians for is four pi over eight. So the integral is gonna be pi over two stair radians. Okay. So that's how we do those things. Well just to conclude the question of integration, um we also will build integrals in volumes. In general the volume element is a scalar parameter. So we can have a function, a scalar function times uh, differential volume or a vector field differential volume. You can have those integrals. And in this case, now the differential volume is going to be the product of the three 
mutually orthogonal directions, right? H1 du, H2 dv, and H3 dw. That's the volume element in a generalized coordinate system. Then you have those special cases in XYZ coordinate system, uh, in cylindrical system, and in spherical system. In this case, specifically, you can also always write like this R square, the R, the omega. Okay? Uh, very well. Let's just make and go to the final part of the class, today's lecture. Um, I'm going to define a first in interesting differential operation called the gradient. Uh, the gradient has a very interesting meaning. I mean, that's I mean you have derivatives in one dimension. Well, the general derivative in three dimensions is a vector, which is the gradient vector. Okay, it has the same the same interpretation of other of the plan, uh, of, of the uh, one dimension derivative. Okay, so let's see what it is. Uh, so consider that you have a function that which is set to a constant value, f equals c. Then I make a small displacement of this constant by this c, right? So this uh, is the way. The the, I mean, the I mean, when you have a function f equals c, we have a surface s1. And when I displace c by a small amount, I have a very closed surface, S2. So these are the conditions, f equals c, c plus dc. I have a point that might lie here. Uh, let me just decrease the size here. I have a point that might lie on S1 and might lie or, uh, on S2 or not. You know, But let's say that uh, we go from uh, one point to, to another one, which are very close. Those points are very close. So if we do that, we go along uh, a small displacement, the L. This displacement, we already expressed that in Cartesian coordinates, right? So the question is, well, what is the variation of F from going from... Um, P to Q, right? Or for any neighbor point next to P. Well, uh, what we do is we just say that, I mean, for instance, if P uh, is represented by coordinates X, um, Y, Z, and Q is very close, it means that X is, uh, X is a little variation x plus dx, y is a little vari variation y plus dy, and z is z plus dz. So we have here, in fact, the I mean the x, dy, and dz are the elements of the L, in fact, right? That's what those are. Um, So the question is, what is the change in f in going from p to q? Well, f at point q equals to f at point p plus a small correction, right? A small correction can be calculated using Taylor series. If we are very close, the corrections are calculated by the derivatives are, are across the three directions multiplied by the corresponding corrections, which are the x, the y, and the z. So uh, f at point q equals f point p approximately plus the x, the f, the x, where? At p or at q? Well, it doesn't matter. p and q are, are very close, right? can be at, at p, right? You can calculate this at p if you want. But if you calculate at q, you don't make a big error because they are very close. So I'm going to drop that, uh, you know, where you are calculating. You are calculating 
where the function is being eva evaluated. I mean, uh, very close to P, so that doesn't matter. dy df dy plus dz df dz, right? And fp, fq minus fp is a change, which is very small, is df. So df is equal to dx, df dx plus dy, df dy plus dz df dz and now we are going to start exploring our vector algebra right well we can identify that this thing here has components of the l right that's what appears in there So the components of the L are right here. There's a second vector that appears here, a vector that has components, the f dx, the f dy, the f dz. So the second vector uh, is going to be written like this. I'm going to put the versor on the left. I will later explain why. Uh, plus a y df dy plus a z df dz. It's clear that um, this vector dot product with this vector here yields df, right? So I'm gonna call this vector that has these three components the gradient of f. This is a vector, right? Let's the error just to remember that okay. in fact this is the action of this operator ax ddx plus a y ddy plus a z ddz applied to f so this is a differential operator which is a vector right so this operator we are going to call it the del or nabla operator so in this way, uh, I can use a very simple recipe to calculate the small changes of a function in three dimensions. If I want to make a small, co a small variation of coordinates upon which the function depends, I just make a dot product of the differential length with that gradient of f vector, which I just defined. So that's a very compact way to define that you know product of three terms times three terms, which results in a sum of three terms, right? But in fact, I'm representing that in a compact way. Okay, so uh, the operation uh, nabla f is called the gradient. So I have a function, a scalar function. I apply the nabla or the del operator on f and produce this vector, which is called the gradient of f. And once I calculate the gradient of f, if I multiply and make a dot product with the differential displacements, I have the small change in function. That's how you make a Taylor series in 3D. You make the product of the, you know, the dot product, the gradient times the displacement vector okay but i mean gradient has some important properties right um if i uh let me go back to the pictures here let me show you the pictures if you pick q very close to p but lying on the surface s1 right to any, any point. I mean, I go to any direction here, but line, imagine that I'm in very close, uh, um, small variations of, of uh, going from point to another, but line on the surface. I'm going on the tangent plane, that tangent, that is tangent to the surface. What happens? Well, f equals constant, the f equals to zero right 
So if I, I pick Q close to P, very on the surface, Nabla and the L, in this case, give you a zero dot product. It means that, given F, Nabla of F is a very well-defined vector in space, already pointing in some direction. If I pick directions that are orthogonal to F, which are, sorry, orthogonal to the gradient, I have a zero value. And, and, and so it means that gradient is orthogonal to F equals C. That's the first property, right? Gradient is orthogonal to F equals C. There's one first important property. So I have a function F, which is nothing, just a function of three variables. Then I define a surface, F equals C. Then if I calculate the gradient of F at a given point, it's going to be the normal direction. It's going to point to the, you know, along the normal direction to that surface, right? What else? Now, in, if now I, I mean, I have the gradient points to one given direction. If I align the L along the gradient, right? What do we have? The F. This is the direction of the gradient, which is normal, right? The F equals C. I can go from P to Q along different directions here. But if I choose to go along the gradient direction, I have the minimum distance. This is the smallest distance. And when I align the L ve vector along the vector gradient of F, I have a dot product that is positive, right? Then I have that uh, I, I, you know, uh, I get the smallest direction. So the F is going to be equal to magnitude of gra gradient times the smallest distance between surfaces S1 and S2. So that's what we get. I mean, dot product now is cosine of 0 equals 1. So I have the magnitude of gradients. This is what? The maximum rate of change of F in the point that you are considering. Right? So gradient is orthogonal to F equals constant and has a magnitude that, that gives the maximum variation of F relative to the coordinates points to the direction, towards the direction of a maximum change of a function. It's very important to make optimization, for instance, optimization of uh, objective functions. If you define the function, calculate the gradients, then you go, you know, uh, to a maximum uh, uh, of the surface when the gradient becomes, uh, you know, zero, then have a uh, optimum uh, solution. Uh, of your problem. So, um, <coughs> uh, let me see here, just a second, let me just see what we have there. Yeah, that, that's the final. I have a small example here. So, I mean, gradient is useful to calculate normal directions, right? Normal directions are important sometimes. So I have to find I have to find the normal direction of surface. Uh, use the gradient, right? For instance, have an ellipsoid here in this example. I mean, we don't have an ellipsoid. We have a function of three variables, which is just a function, right? This is not surface. A, s a function that is represented by this sum of three parameters. A, B, and C are, you know, uh, length parameters. Now, F equals 1 represents an ellipsoid. F uh, not being set uh, to any value is just a function. But when you make F equals a constant, then you get a surface, because a surface is a relationship between three coordinates. So specifically in this case, we have an ellipsoid, right? Uh, 
And let's say that you want to calculate what are the normal directions to the ellipsoid. You have two solutions, right? You have one that goes outside and one that goes inside. So what do we do? I mean, we calculate the gradient of this, this surface, f equals 1. For instance, um, I define a function g equals to f minus 1, right? g equals 0 is the ellipsoid. Right? Calculating gradient of g is the same as calculating gradient of f. So I'm going to calculate gradient of f. So f equals to x over a square plus y over b square plus z over c square. Gradient of f, so is the f dx. right? Uh, plus the f dy plus the f dz right? 2 x, or, uh, sorry I, I forgot the verses here so we have that uh, x over a2 ax plus y over b2 b square a y plus z over c square a z um, so uh, in f equals 1 I have the ellipsoid right so I have to use that condition to calculate the ellipsoid um, so, for instance, I can exp I mean, I, I will only get the normal direction when I express f equals 1. In other words, when I express one of the coordinates relative to the other. It might be instructive to calculate z as a function of x and y. If you do that, right, you can express z as a function of... Uh, oh, this pen is not working again. Just a second. So, um, continuing. When I make f equals to 1, means that I'm going to express z as a function of x and y using the equation. Uh, right? So, you're going to have this relationship here. And then I replace z by this expression. Then I have the gradient of f as f equals to 1 right here, right? So I want to have a function of two variables, x and y. So I have the first term, second term, and z. Uh, well, z over c squared times c, that's why we have a c here. So that's what we get there. So you use one solution for z positive. And use, I mean, you can change the sign of this. We have a vector that goes to the other side, OK? So if I divide by the magnitude of this vector here, we have a unit vector, a versor, that is normal to the ellipsoid. That's how you would calculate. To conclude this class, let's just make a the general definition of the Nabla operation, because as you well know, Maxwell's equations are relations, differential equations, in differential form, differential form uh, they involve the Nabla operator in all of them. So let's look at the how the Nabla operator looks in different coordinate systems. So the general definition is that, I mean, is a versor in a given direction times the derivative relative to the differential length are along that corresponding direction. Okay, so along the u direction is the l u that goes in the denominator. Along the v is the l v. Along the w is the l w. So using our h parameters, you're going to have this, you know, h one du u, h two dv, h three dw, and you have the expressions in the three coordinate systems. Okay, the simplest one is in the rectangular system. There's no you know, additional things besides the derivatives.
right? The, the derivative operators. But then you go, you know, cylindrical surface, you have an R here because this is length, right? You have the Z. In spherical, you have R d theta, R sine theta, theta d phi because it's the length along that duration. And finally, let me warn you, we're going to talk about that in the next class, le next, next lecture. Uh, we always place the unit vectors, the versors, on the left of the differential operators, okay? Uh, because if you put on the right, you have to make the deriv derivative operation also on, on the versors. That's why uh, they are on the left. It means that I, don't, I do, do not make derivative of verso because everything that goes to the right of the number operator has to be uh, differentiated. That's why I put the verses on the left. They are not on the, on the right. Okay. Very well. Uh, we conclude this second lecture of the class and we continue next week. Until then, bye-bye.